Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining our talk today, for, which is about simulator training for hardware pilots. Um, let me give you a short overview uh, of our talk today. Uh, let us introduce a little bit, talk a little bit about ourselves, uh, give you some hardware overview of the uh, project and the system itself. Let me talk a little bit about needs and challenges, what was a little bit our motivation uh, for this talk and the motivation for the topic itself. And of course, then Kevin will take over and we'll talk about the simulator architecture, which uh, we implemented. Uh, he'll give you a little bit of a deeper insight into the implementation itself. And uh, of course, uh, at the end, we'll give you a short overview of our lessons and conclusions. Uh, so, let me give you a short introduction of Kevin and myself. So, Kevin is a senior software engineer and trainer at KDAP. And in the particular project where we did this development, he had the role of a technical project lead for the HMI development. Um, some words about myself. I'm the head of embedded ARM and PCAP touch development at Data Module. And in this particular project, I had the role of a project lead for hardware, embedded hardware development, and the Linux BSP development. And of course, the software development itself. Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the hardware architecture of the HMI. So the core processor, which you can see here on the right-hand side, that is a ARM processor by NXP, which is the IMX8M mini application processor. Um, on the right-hand side, we have uh, the display chain, which connects via MIPI DSi uh, to LVDS. And uh, we have a beautiful 19-inch bar-type stretched LVDS display connected, uh, where we can design really great user interfaces. The return path for the actual user interaction is made by a PCAP touch, uh, which is connected via I2C uh, to the application processor. And on the right-hand side, we have a sensor and actuator chain. So with the interface of I uh, SPI uh, to CAN, uh, we have connected via the CAN bus a sensor and actuator board, which provides us uh, some sensor data on the right-hand side, on the, on the lower side right here. And we have some actuators on the, on the left-hand side here. So basically how that works is we have a user interface on the display. Um, the user right in front of the HMI does some inputs via the PCAP touch and the application processor running all the back end and the front end by software gives uh, either comments via SPA, SPI and CAN to the sensor board, which for example um, triggers one of the actuators or uh, we will receive some data from the sensors, which can read out by uh, the CAN interface and the sensor board. So this is the basic uh, interaction scheme, what we're facing at the HMI itself. So uh, of course, this being embedded days, uh, let's take a little bit of a deeper look into the uh, design of the single board computer that, we, uh, that we've been using or we're still using right now. As I mentioned before, the processor itself is an IMX 8M Mini by NXP processor. Uh, it's currently in that particular application where we're using a dual core uh, of uh, the A53 um, ARM, Cortex ARM uh, core, which is running at 1.8 uh, gigahertz. Um, but there's also a solo variant and a quad variant available for that particular application processor. But um, you know, the dual core seemed to be like a good idea for that, uh, which gives us reasonable performance. Um, there is a co-processor available, which is mainly the purpose of that processor is mainly for time critical applications like real time aspects. Um, currently, there is no such requirement uh, for that in that particular project, but right now, this is a Cortex-M4, 400 megahertz, right here in this application processor. Um, we have connected one gigabyte of low-power DDR4 RAM. Um, we have various serial interface memory connected for some side data that has morely um, or mainly um, some, some not-so-important purpose. 
mainly administration data that we are holding here in those memories. Uh, the main memory, uh, which is 16 gigabyte of EMMC storage, which of course holds the Linux operating system as well as the application software as well. Uh, we have a real-time clock connected here and a watchdog to give some security. There are some debug connectors right here, which is mainly UART and JTAG uh, that is fed to an internal connector. The um, MIPI display uh, and LVDS display chain in combination with uh, the backlight for the display itself. Uh, the touch is connected via I2C. Uh, the touch controller itself is uh, on the actual flex of the touchscreen. Um, we have an audio path as well, which is connected via I2S uh, and is feeding into a codec and amplifier. And we have a speaker output here as well. We've got one USB um, on that single board computer, and we have uh, the CAN interface as well, and some power circuitry and some control circuitry. Um, the main communication interface to the outside world is, uh, well, the single interface that we have is the USB 2.0 connector, uh, as well as the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module. So this is the Wi-Fi connection and Bluetooth connection, where also all the update procedures are uh, implemented with. So there's actually no hardware um, Ethernet connection right here. Uh, as an operating system, we are running a, a, a Linux, which is um, mainly a mainline Linux kernel focusing on 5.10 right now. Um, we're using Yocto 3.1, which is the Dunfell release long-term support. And currently, we're still on queued uh, 5.12. Um, let me give you a short insight into the driver model that is actually right here available for the CAN bus interface. The CAN bus interface is actually the interface where the um, sensor and actuator, actuator board is connected. Uh, and this is going to be our, our main interface for the application that we are talking uh, right now. So uh, this is the important interface for the talk, actually. Since the uh, iMix Ada Mini doesn't have a native CAN interface, we have to use an SPI to CAN converter. So this is why you are seeing the MCP25625 right down here, which is actually providing the CAN bus interface at the very bottom, and then the upper interface is I uh, I uh, SPI. Sorry. Um, Therefore, and, and of course, an SPI driver or the SPI driver framework is needed, which is basically below the actual CAN driver right here. And uh, one thing that we're using is actually we're using the uh, socket interface under, under Linux. Um, so there was a certain point in time where uh, a, a CAN socket interface was developed in, uh, in Linux to... Of course, we all know the socket interface when we're talking about networking for, for Ethernet. Uh, but right here to bring uh, sockets also in the world of CAN interfaces, there's also a CAN socket interface available. So the Linux socket layer basically uh, should then uh, should be the highest uh, layer in the, in the actual kernel space of the application. Um, on top of that, we have a programming API. That API provides us like remote procedure calls and data points that we can address from the Qt application, which is the highest level we're talking about. And that is the real point of interest right here. Um, at that point, Kevin will talk about our simulator that we implemented right here in that area. So the API delivers a certain abstraction layer um, that is available to handle, handle uh, actuator and sensor communications via R RPC calls and data points for sensor data. So what were our needs and challenges for thinking about um, simulation and what was our motivation for that? So, of course, what we wanted to have is a certain level of automated testing. So we wanted to be able to run unit tests and component and system level tests of code that communicates with the sensor and actuator boards. Of course, we wanted to do automated user interface testing in that example with Squitch, and we would be able to run those on, on a CI environment. So a certain level of automation in the overall product. 
Um, we wanted to have fast development times and avoid any unnecessary deployment and, and building that uh, would need us to have like code on the target and, and maybe introducing some, some delays in the development chain. And of course, we wanted to have a certain control over values, uh, also, for example, to provoke errors in the, in the whole setup. So sometimes there is a certain error state that you want to provoke and that maybe doesn't really, isn't really reproducible in the actual hardware setup, but you want to make sure that, that your code addresses it. So therefore, a certain simulation of such a hardware target is probably a good idea. Um, what were the challenges that we were facing as well and that gave us additional motivation to think about simulation? Um, of course, when, when we talk about development in such a project, there's always a certain parallel approach to it. So the hardware of the sensor and actuator board was in development. Uh, the communication pro protocol on the CAN bus was uh, under development. And so we have various development stages of hardware and software in parallel that uh, motivated us to think about a, a certain simulation approach. The CAN communication protocol itself was under development and also under um, in, in a certain process of extension. So uh, that was also something that motivated us. And of course, uh, the limited availability of hardware. Um, this is something that really gave us uh, a motivation to think about that because we had four sets of hardware, uh, roughly eight developers in three different countries. And of course, all of this was uh, amplified by COVID-19 and the overall homeworking situation. And uh, now to give you a certain overview of the implementation and to give you also some code examples and to dive a little bit deeper into the development itself, I would like to hand it over to Kevin right now. Right. So um, first, I, 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 um, an overview of the um, general architecture of design decisions we made, and then um, we have a look at an example on how that is actually implemented. Um, we wanted to be able to run the simulator in process and out of process, in process for the automated tests and out of process for actual development, out of process even out of machine so that we could use the simulator on the developer machine while the software is running on the actual target um, just to be able to um, test on the software deployed to the target but not with the harder backend. Um, Right, so, the, so we, got, we went with a server-client model, or a server-client architecture, um, and the simulator is being the server in this case. It waits for connections from the HMI, from our main software, and then um, initiates the, the you know, protocol connection and so on. Um, the um, side effect of that is that we even can keep state across uh, software restart, so the simulator is like the actual hardware um, has its own life cycle. So if our software restarts, the simulator still has the correct um, values for sensors and actuators, simulated values for actuators. And when the software restarts, it will get those values instead of startup values. So it's uh, very close to the actual um, behavior with the hardware backend. For the implementation, we went with a shared library for the simulator core that handles all the communication and so forth. It has uh, Q-object-based APIs. So it uses signals for incoming requests. Um, on top of that, we have a widget-based UI for directly controlling um, actuator positions, simulated values, um, seeing the requests, and so on. Um, we have a, another, like basically the unit test, so auto test use that API directly. And the squish test has another wrapper or another um, layer on top of that that provides actuator positions and sensor values via property API so that, that those can be easily manipulated and read from the Squish uh, Python code. Right. So for the general implementation, we went with TCP IP as the communication, um, as the transport methods. Um, we are using Google protocol buffers as our messaging framework. And we use our own custom message framing um, to detect when a message starts and when a message ends. Um, 
for the um, as Alex said earlier, we have a, the the vendor of the board provides a C++ a library to actually interact with the board, so we don't have to um, um, look at this at the lower level. We simply replace the library um, that we get from the vendor with our own implementation. As you can see on the uh, bottom right side, that's a, a conditional built in our uh, QMake project file. So if we empty, simulate, enable, we build our own um, our own integration layer. We build the source code generated by Google Protocol buffers, and we um, set the define in case we need to make decisions based on whether we have simulate or not inside the code. Otherwise, we just link to the uh, API or the implementation, the library that we got from the third-party vendor. Um, in most cases, that is fine. So it's a direct drop-in replacement, right? The API is defined as a C++ interface. So our implementation has the same interface signature and this is derived from the same interface classes. So um, all code using the interfaces is fine um, with, either, with either implementation. In a very few cases, we have uh, to use if devs to um, build conditional code, whether we are doing a simulator um, or we, whether we're using the simulator backend or the um, hardware backend. <clears throat> right. So for the example on how it actually looks, um, I picked part of our startup routine. So at the beginning of the startup of our application, we need to do the handshake with the board or with the software running on the board. That is a multi-stage uh, state machine. Um, implement is a multi-stage state machine, so we, we check, check has the other computer booted, um, if it has booted, what firmware is it running, um, is the firmware type correct, so it could have been a production firmware or it could be a test firmware. Of course, in the real, in the real world deployment situation, we want to have a production firmware, and then we check the version. Are we compatible with the version? So the, the diagram here so shows only the the good, the good transitions, of course, each of those has error transitions that we could, um, that we needed to detect and then handle, like flashing a, a newer version of the of the firmware if we detect an older version. Um, my decode examples will focus on the middle step here, checking the firmware state. So this is a request that we send from our software to the to the hardware backend, or in this case, to our simulate to say, okay, give me the firmware type. Then we expect the response with the type back. Right. So the the API, um, as I said, um, the the vendor API that we are working with is defined as a C plus plus C plus plus interfaces. So um, the firmware type request looks like this. It's just simple get firmware type information, and it gets a C plus plus function as a callback that will be called whenever the the um, information becomes available. Of course, um, unsurprising, our implementation just implements that um, that function, of course, the other functions. So this is, as I said, um, a subset of the actual API uh, focusing on that firmware type request. As I said, our simulator using a, is using a QObject-based API, so we have signals for incoming requests. So we have the signal here, firmware type request received that is emitted on the simulator side when, the, um, when our application has requested a firmware type. And in order to send the response, we have a method here, simple method set firmware type response that gets a flag whether the um, communication was successful. So on the, in the actual hardware that could be uh, not, not successful could mean that the um, can, um, communication has failed. Of course, in our case, it's always successful, but we could use that flag to um, test error states. And then, of course, the firmware type. So very simple. We just re-implement the same interface that the actual board uses and um, provide matching API on the simulator side. As I said, we are using um, Google Protocol buffers um, as the messaging framework to um, encapsulate data sent by, um, that we need to send um, across the TCP IP connection. So the top part here, the top example, is the actual protocol buff, a snippet from the actual protocol buffer file. So we define our package, 
and um, the two messages. So the firmware type request message does not have any arguments, and the firmware type response has this Boolean success flag and an integer that transports the firmware type. Google, Google Protocol Buffer comes with a code generator um, that will then generate C++ code. Um, the lower part here is the C++ code generated by that um, code generator. So the package name transforms into a namespace name, and then we have those messages. The first message has no, um, no API for setting or getting values. The second message, the response message, has values uh, or methods for setting the success value, setting and getting the success value, and setting and getting the firmware type. All um, serialization, deserialization is then handled by the Google Protocol Buffer Library. With those two messages in hand, we can now go on on implementing our um, both sides. Um, so on the on the client side, so that's the side that our software uses the re-implementation of the board interface. Um, we have the the call that we need to implement the the one that was pure virtual in the interface. Um, we simply store the callback in a member, um, generate or create an instance of the message that we need to send, and send this message um, across the TCP IP connection. Once the simulator has responded, we will get uh, a Google protocol buffer message back. We check, is this our response um, that we're expecting? Is this the get firmware type response? If yes, we um, convert it into, the, into our specific message. Uh, retrieve the two values and then call the callback function. So very simple um, duality here for every for every call that we need to implement. We just create the request message, send it. We wait for a response message, unpack it, and um, call the callback. <clears throat> On the simulator side, very very um, similar. Um, here, the incoming request is received, again, as a good Google protocol any message. Again, we check the type. Is it the firmware type request or any of the other requests that we implement? And then we emit the respective signal. Once the simulator code, that could be the um, widget-based UI, that could be the unit test, um, or it could be the squish test, um, decides to send the response, it calls the send function. And the send function is like the original request function. It generates or it creates an instance of the response message, sets the values, and sends the message. So again, very simple, just two methods, one handling the incoming request and one sending the response. Okay. So to, to, to look at how this is being used in our unit test situation, um, this is the part of the code in our program that is using um, that call. So as I said, we have a state machine. That's a queue state machine based implementation. We have this state here, check firmware type state, where we want to request the firmware type. And then um, depending on which um, firmware type we get, we either transition into um, a state where we say, OK, um, now we are done. Um, this is, this is a, OK. This is the production firmware. Um, go further, go into the check firmware version state, or if it's not, we have um, a mismatch, we go into a state where we flash the, I, I op, uh, we flash the boards um, firmware again. Right? So these signals can um, then also use by the unit test to detect which of the transition got triggered. So there's a very nice um, side effect here. So it's used internally by the state machine to um, move from one state to another, and it also, also allows the unit test to detect when certain state transitions happen. Right. So um, the unit test now has two sides to work with. It has the simulator object um, that it, um, and it can control to send responses whenever it needs to, and it has the actual uh, Un um, object under test, in this case, our state machine. So we are using an, a standard Qt unit test setup here, um, as you can see with the Qt signal spice being used to uh, capture signal emits. So we have one spy set up on the simulator side to be able to detect and verify that we got the firmware type request. And on the state machine side, we have um, a signal. In this case, we're testing the positive, the positive reaction so we have a signal spy to um, wait for the firmware check, type check done. 
So how does the test execute? Right. So before that, of course, we check for the for the boot state um, that again is um, left out here to focus on this very specific call. So we wait um, for the firmware type request to appear on the simulator side. So our software has requested the firmware type. Then um, we simulate the response to that, sending OK, send firmware type response. We have a successful response and we have the expected the production um, type firmware. And then um, we expect as the test case, as the test scenario, that our state machine will um, send the signal that will allow it internally to go on into the next state, the um, state that checks the firmware, which is the firmware type done uh, signal. So we wait for that signal to appear and verify that it has happened. Um, as Alex said earlier, this is one of the needs that we have, right? Very strict, very or very correct um, control over timing and values. So the simulator allows us here to act, wait for a certain uh, signal to happen, then respond with very specific values, and then again check that the values have been correctly received on the actual software side and correctly processed. So we have very correct, uh, very strict, and very fine control over the values and the timing. Right. Um, the the um, we also have a we also have a, a UI for that. Um, as I said, a widget based UI. This is um, again the part that deals with the startup sequence. Um, so you can see in the bottom half we have a log on incoming requests. So there was the boot state request, there was the firmware type request, and the software type request. Um, the simulate or the simulator UI here is allowed to do automatic responses. As you can see, there's a checkbox check, so it has um, automatically sent the best possible values for each of those requests. Of course, I could uncheck those and then use the widget in the upper half of the user interface to simulate whatever uh, values I want. I could send a, um, like a, a boot status that says it's still booting. I could set, set a different. I could send a different um, firmware type. Um, I could send a version that I want to test um, different different cases in our in our startup routine to specifically test error cases and so on. Right. So um, that leads us to our lessons and conclusions. Um, it works very well, so we are very happy with the setup. Um, it allows us in a, in a great uh, deal to test our software um, in, in, as in automated tests and well as in real life tests without needing the hardware. Um, as Alex said, one of the challenges was that we didn't have enough hardware for all the uh, developers. But even if you have hardware, it's nice to have very good control over the values and when they are sent and so on. So um, the simulator helps in that respect as well. Um, the TCP IP um, bit for, for as our communication channel or as a transport is a bit problematic <clears throat> for the automated tests when they are executed in parallel, right? The server, the simulator component needs to allocate a port. It needs to bind a port to listen for connections. And only one simulator can own, uh, bind the port at any given time. So we need to find an open or an available port for each of those uh, simulator um, objects in, in, in the parallel, ex parallel executed tests, um, which of course is, is doable, but it would be nice. It would have been nicer to all, to have a, like a switchable transport, something, um, a specific, specific for the, um, in process simulator to not be necessary, to not have the, to not, um, be, um, burdened by that, um, requirement of TCP IP. So maybe for, for a later implementation or for, for, for a um, second, second generation implementation, we will be going for skipping the transport layer and just um, forwarding the arguments um, in an asynchronous way, um, maybe using um, QMIT the object invoke methods. Another thing that turned out to be a bit of a hassle is the Google protocol buffers. It's super easy to use, as you have seen. Um, it allows really easy um, um, definition of, of messages and their, their arguments, um, but it, it, it's a bit problematic as a dependency. 
you either need to have pre-built binaries um, in your version control system. That's what we currently do. Um, fortunately, we only have two platforms. That's the embedded Linux and the ARM build that we have for the target and the desktop Linux build for the development machines. But of course, um, if you have multiple different operating systems on, on the development side or on the target side, that becomes a hassle. Um, building it takes too long for every build. So um, building it every time um, from source is not an option either. So another option would be to have a package managed situation where you can um, pull pre-compiled um, and platform and compiler specific binaries um, in that. But of course, it could also be possible or, or it could be necessary or better to use a different form of messaging implementation, even maybe something handwritten. Um, but it's it's difficult to beat Google Protocol buffers on the ease of use than um, adding new API. Okay, that was was the um, the look under the hood of our implementation. Um, I hope you you enjoyed the talk, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Alex. Um, we have time here for a couple of quick questions. Um, how was the CAN communication simulated um, on the desktop simulator? Right. Um, so we didn't simulate the CAN communication at all. Um, our the the vendor for the for the um, sensor port provided a C plus plus API, and we essentially replaced that. So we implemented the. Um, we put the simulator in at a higher level. So we did not simulate the CAN communication at all. OK. Um, how much of the development was done using the simulator? And did the transition from the simulator to the embedded device go smoothly? OK, yeah. Um, actually, a lot of development happens with the simulator. Um, as we said earlier, there is only a limited number of hardware available for a lot of people. So um, essentially, um, like half of the developers don't have access to a device or only via remote um, via remote access. So a lot of development happens um, with the simulator. Even as I said, even the developers who have a board sometimes use the simulator to control the software on the target device. Um, and um, so it's a at least half, if not more, of the development work um, is done with the simulator. Um, the transition usually works fine as well, unless, of course, we did not um, implement the, the, the simulator correctly, in which case we discovered that when testing with the actual uh, hardware, and then we just fix the simulator so the next time it has the correct behavior. Mm -hmm.